Hi everyone. Um, so I have now seen all ten Best Picture uh, nominees. Um, I just saw The King's Speech this last weekend, uh, which means that I've seen all ten of them. And uh, let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six of those movies are in my top ten of the year. That's pretty good. That's a nice average. Much better than last year when Avatar and Inglorious Bastards and uh, uh, District 9 and The Hurt Locker. Th those movies didn't exactly thrill me. Not, not the way they did this year. So uh, it's good. It's good. Uh, lo looking real good here. Um, I've seen one, two, three, four of the Best Actor nominees. I've seen one, two, three, four, five, all five of the be uh, Best Supporting Actor nominees. Um, haven't seen Nicole Kidman Rabbit Hole. I could do that this week if I if I so felt like it. Not seen Jackie Weaver in Animal Kingdom. Uh, seen all five of the Best Director nominees, of course. Uh, so yeah, um, I'm uh, well informed, I'd say. Um, now the King's Speech uh, has got the most nominations, and uh, it is uh, tipped to be um, the one to beat for Best Picture this year. Um, it's sort of coming down between that and the social network for the most part. Black Swan's made a hundred million bucks by now. It's, it's, it's something. They just announced that recently. Um, and uh, there was another film, I think, that uh, just kind of low profile but managed to, 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 to make, make some bank, uh, which is great. Um, I'm not the biggest Black Swan fan, um, but I certainly do uh, appreciate uh, and I'm glad that uh, Aronofsky is uh, making some bank there. That's good. So I want to talk a little bit about the King's Speech. Because, um, like I said, it is more or less the favorite uh, in the Best Picture category, uh, for right now, anyway. Um, you know, it's got the most number of nominees, and everyone seems to think it's uh, fantastic. Well, you know, a few don't. Um, overall, I like the film, um, but I have a few problems with some of the filmmaking technique. Um, first of all, it's a pretty conventional story. What was the movie that it reminded me of as I was watching it? Um, kind of... Uh, uh, Hmm. Yeah, the Full Monty. It kind of reminded me of the Full Monty. Uh, and the reason for that is, is because in the Full Monty, no matter how many times the guys practice their dance, they can never seem to get it right. They always screwed up. But then when it comes down to actually doing the performance uh, at the close of the film, they pull it off perfectly. I don't want to give the ending away of the King speech, but if you know your history, um, you know that uh, King George VI uh, didn't, uh, you know, stop in the middle of his speech, just walk away from the microphone. Um, the movie climaxes with, a, um, with the uh, address that he gives, his first public radio address that he gives live uh, to people not only in England but also in several other countries around the world. Um, and Jeffrey Rush is there with him, you know, trying to encourage him. He's actually sort of conducting him uh, as he speaks, which is really great. Um, I was struck by the I, uh, fact that um, um, that, uh, that Colin Firth, uh, who plays uh, George the uh, Six, or Birdie, as he's known to uh, those familiar with him, um, had to, that Colin Firth had to uh, try and mimic the way that George the Six delivers this very speech, because there's undoubtedly a recording of it that he listened to, but also keep it in line with what we know of the character and how the character is developed during the uh, course of the film. And so you have this very sort of halting where he takes it just a, a few words at a time and there's these pauses in between. Um, I gotta say, it was very suspenseful because I used to be an actor um, and I, uh, I, you know, I know the anxiety and the excitement about performing in front of a live audience, you know, and, and not wanting to screw up and, and, and ruin their enjoyment, not ruin it for the people that you're, you're performing with. Um, so I, I really connected to that, of course. And... Uh, it, it also didn't hurt to have a particular favorite Beethoven piece playing during that scene. Uh, about halfway through, I realized, man, this isn't fair. Tears were streaming out of my eyes. I was really emotionally involved. I'm like, you know, they, they're just cheating by using my favorite Beethoven piece. They knew that I would like it just because they put this, uh, they put it in there or something like that, you know, obviously. But, uh, but yeah, obviously it's, uh, it's, it's, it's well, a good job of manipulation, I'd say. Um, one thing that I didn't like about the movie, like I said, it seems sort of conventional in the sense that it's, you know, uh, kind of, kind of just this character trying to, you know, uh, uh, overcome his own demons, I guess. They involve his family, they involve 
how he's intimidated by his father and by his brother. Um, and there's a nice little scene in which he, met, he mentions a few personal things about himself that provide some clues as to why it is that he has such a bad stammer for most of his life. Um, one of which is being left-handed but forced to write right-handed. <laughs> Jeffrey was like, that's very common with a lot of my, my students. I'm just like, ooh, that, that's cool. Um, but one thing that I didn't really care for in the movie was, um, and Tom Hooper is nominated for Best Director for this movie. I really didn't think that he deserved a nomination for Best Director. I mean, not that he didn't uh, uh, work well with the actors. I mean, but the problem is the, his shooting style. He has some very, very strange choices as far as the lenses that he used uses and um, and uh, and the uh, just just the way the shots are framed you know it's like here I am sitting here talking and and the frame you know is around my head like this and they'll have cam people back far away and they they'll be in like the lower corner of the frame you know just sitting normally but but he'll just frame them kind of high and wide it's, it's very very strange I don't really understand it and a lot of the wide-angle fish islands as they use this distort you know, the background unnecessarily in, d in a distracting way. Um, there's one scene in which I, I feel that it's appropriate uh, to use that wide-angle distorting lens, but uh, on the whole, I would just prefer that he, you know, shoot a little more normally. And the worst part is, during his big climactic speech, Colin Firth has a shot where he, they use that wide-angle lens and they basically stick the camera like really, really close to him. Imagine if you can see like, you probably can't see my entire face because I'm too close. But if you were like that close to the camera and it was, it, the, angle on it is so wide that you can see his whole face. It's like, like he's he's sticking his face like through the background. It's really, really strange looking. And it's distracting. Um, so again, I'm not really sure what what the deal was with those uh, with those shooting choices. But uh, because of that I really don't feel like Tom Hooper deserves a best director nomination. So I'm more inclined to uh, more inclined than ever to uh, uh, root for Fincher <laughs> like I wasn't already. Um, but uh, but yeah overall decent movie. Um, Jeffrey Rush and Helen Barton Carter are nominated for their roles, um, and they were fine. I didn't think that they were spectacular or anything like that. I like Jeffrey Rush for the most part. Um, Helen Bonham Carter didn't really have a lot to do in this movie. Not that she wasn't good, she just, you know, I think she got her Supporting Actress nomination simply because she's in the movie. Whereas if Mother and Child were had 12 nominations, then not only would uh, Naomi Watts be nominated, but Annette Bening and maybe even Jimmy Smits and Samuel Jackson would be nominated too. Uh, but that movie just didn't get the attention. Um, and The King's Speech did, so there you go. Uh, so uh, yeah, still digging uh, Christopher Nolan uh, and Inception. Uh, still will want that movie to win you know, uh, a lot of good stuff. Uh, like original screenplay, still want Toy Story 3 to win Best Picture, still want David Fincher to win Best Director, um, and uh, that's kind of where I am with that. Um, now, I was, I was thinking about the fact that um, only just two years ago we had five Best Picture nominees, um, and people were complaining that The Dark Knight didn't win uh, a nomination, Wally was not nominated for Best Picture, it really deserved a nomination for Best Picture, not just Best Animated Feature. So the very next year they opened the uh, nominations for Best Picture up through 10, and thus you had movies like District 9 get nominated, which it probably wouldn't have uh, in a previous year. I mean, that's that's a very, very unusual Best Picture nominee, to be sure. Um, and here we have, again, another 10 nominations, and of course there are a lot of very deserving films nominated uh, for Best Picture. Um, but people, of course, are still complaining about the snubs. Well, you know, Christopher Nolan, no director nomination for Christopher Nolan. And perhaps next year when they open the category for Best Director up to 10 nominees instead of just five, after all we have 10 Best Picture nominees, and we have 10 Male Actor nominees, and 10 uh, Female Actor nominees, and 10 Screenplay nominees, uh, why not pen, uh, 10 Best Director nominees as well? Of course, even if they do that, which they probably won't, but even if they do, people will still get snubbed. People will complain about, oh, you know, Ryan Gosling should be nominated for Blue Valentine, Mila Kunis should be nominated for Black Swan, it's, it's a crime, it's a horrible injustice. You know, the Oscars aren't the only game in town. They may act like the biggest, and a lot of people certainly treat them that way. But you have the Independent Spirit Awards one day earlier. You know, you've got lots of critics uh, awards. You know, there's awards being flown, flung all over the place. Um, and uh, I, of course, you know, have been watching the Oscars uh, every year for a long time, with the exception of one year. In 1996, I did not watch the Oscars because my favorite movie that year was Seven, and it was so utterly assured that it was the best picture, not only of that year, but of the previous two years prior and the, previous, and, and the next two years uh, after that. 
that I refused to sit there for three hours and watch Mel Gibson collect Oscars for Braveheart and no nom and no uh, uh, not even a nomination for David Fincher, no nomination for the screenplay, not for the cinematography, not for the makeup effects, which are incredible, not for Morgan Freeman, not for Kevin Spacey. The only nomination got was for editing. Hey, very well edited picture, but you know, let's let's have a little more love there. So I didn't even watch the Oscars that year. Instead, I I I, I, pro I probably just watched seven. I don't remember <laughs> what it was. I probably watched something else. It was probably seven because I didn't want to watch Mel Gibson get win a Best Director Oscar. <sighs> I bet people are regretting that now. Um, so uh, yeah. Yeah, of course, I like the Oscars. I think they're fun. Um, and uh, I want people that I like to win. But I try and remember that although the Oscars may try and make all the other award ceremonies look like wannabes, Oscars are a wannabe award organization as well. They want to be seen as the big guy in the room. They want to be seen as the standard by which everyone else judges all the other awards. It's the one they lead up to. And when the Oscars move uh, up a month, and shorten the awards period by two months uh, from January through February instead of January through the end of March. Uh, it makes everyone else move up as well. And, and people just get burned out in award shows that much more easily, I think. Um, anyway, just want to rant a little bit about that. Thanks for watching. Take it easy.